just to be clear, number one, I am not a graphics artist. <laughs> number two, this presentation was put together about three days ago and has not been spruced up. Therefore, it is going to look like crap. Some of the alignment will be off, the graphics will suck, and I hate the color. But other than that, I hope you like the content. And all I have to do is find my little Vanna White clicker. So um, I'm going to jump in. And like I said, I wanted to call this blockchain for blondes, not in a pejorative way, but I've done, for those of you that don't know, just real quick, I've, I've started 11 companies. Five were the first one in the world to do something. We've done a bunch of cool stuff. We just won the contest in San Francisco against Oscar, who said, I'm going to win the contest, and almost. All right, but I'm going to jump in. Here's what I'd like to say, though. What I'm going to talk about is I'm not going to teach you how the blockchain works. I'm going to show you how the blockchain works for you. And here's what I mean by that. How many of you actually know how the Internet works? TCIP protocols, HTML. If you really want to know how the Internet works, that's how the Internet works. That's the code that drives the Internet. Any of you that want to learn how it works, have at it. But the result of that is what does the internet do for you? That code creates a website. What I want to do is I want to know how does a website help my business. I don't need to know how does the website work. And that's where I think a lot of these presentations, and we've been in a bunch of them, it's decentralized. There's so much blockchain babble. I'm pretty technical, and I don't know how this stuff works. But what I realize is I don't need to know how it works. I need to know how it works for me or for you as a business. And that's what we're going to talk about. And what I like to start out with is, in my opinion, there was no internet before the internet. Would you guys agree with that? Before the internet, there was no internet. Well, what does that mean? The internet, to me, was not an industry. The internet's a technology that disrupted industries. It either disrupted them or in many cases, it actually just enhanced them. It created efficiencies. So I get this a lot. Oh, are you in the blockchain industry? And I look at people, I go, I don't know what that means. It's like saying, are you in the internet industry? There, there is no industry of blockchain. There are industries being built on top of the blockchain. That's where I think it gets interesting. But the internet as a whole, the blockchain I believe is going to be bigger, but I'll tell you why. Not because it's better, but I think there's some reasons. All right, so the internet, in my opinion, disrupted industries. Would you guys agree there's things out there, Airbnb, Uber, things like that? This should move forward. There we go. Internet, in my opinion. Again, this is just my opinion. You guys can go where you want. At the most part, the internet's a communication. It's a delivery platform. It delivers information. It delivers communication. It disrupted companies by creating efficiencies. Would you guys agree Uber, Airbnb, those sort of disrupted industries? But then you've got online banking. Have any of you guys used online banking? Have you paid your bills online? Have you bought your travel? That to me is an efficiency. The internet just brought about efficiencies that made our life easier. The internet and the blockchain are sort of similar in my opinion. But then we fast forward from a communication platform, Skype, WhatsApp, people have heard of Telegram. Telegram's sort of the new little darling. I'll show you in a little bit why Telegram is relevant in terms of how it works for the internet. I'm going to start with what is Bitcoin. Everybody heard of Bitcoin? Here's the way I describe Bitcoin. Brock and my buddies tried to get me in Bitcoin years ago. Bitcoin to me, this is my personal explanation, is a glorified gift card. Meets a penny stock. And here's what I mean. I can go out and buy a $1,000 American Express gift card, give it to any one of you. You guys are probably like that. It's anonymous. Nobody knows where it came from or where I got it. And you would have to walk up and down 3rd Street hoping somebody might accept that gift card. Bitcoin's kind of the same way. How do you get one? You have to buy it. Not all the merchants accept it. One day they may or may not. But if you bought a penny stock on that gift card, you could have that $1,000 and you could wake up tomorrow and it might be worth $800, it might be worth $1,200. So the volatility tied to a Bitcoin is very high. If, if any of you are businesses and somebody paid you $1,000 today and you woke up tomorrow and it was 700 would that be a problem? 
Could be. Think about if that was $10 million or 20. Like the volatility is just crushing. So I think it's very difficult for the Bitcoins of the world to ultimately become a true payment platform, but they could make it. And this whole thing about merchants not accepting the risk, merchants are really risk averse. So I think Bitcoin has some challenges as a payment vehicle. But to me, it's fascinating. It's like gold. And again, if this were done properly, all of this would animate and it would reveal itself properly. <laughs> it's not going to. You're just going to get it all at once. So here's the deal. How many of you have actually ever held a bar of gold? A full bar? A couple people. It's $506,000 for a bar of gold. Most of us are probably, A, never going to buy a bar of gold. Two, we aren't going to hold it. We're certainly not going to walk around with it in our pocket. And if we did own it, we probably wouldn't actually own it. We'd have a certificate telling us we owned it somewhere. Well, what does that do with Bitcoin? Well, if I wanted to buy gold and I can't afford a gold coin, I mean a gold bar, I could buy a gold coin. I could buy a gold inlay. If I wanted to go buy a $100 gold coin, that is a fraction of a gold bar, but that gold coin potentially increases at the same percentage a gold bar does. So I may not have half a million dollars, but I may have 50 or 500, but I can get the same rate of return if gold goes up or down. Bitcoin to me was this sort of decentralized asset, but here's what I need all of you to think about. Supply and demand. If I told you today, hey, gold's $500,000, you're like, okay, great. If I told you tomorrow there's no more gold that's ever going to be mined out of the earth, would any of you maybe go out and buy some gold? Just possibly. Bitcoin's sort of the same way. So this concept of mining to me, I don't know how mining works. I've tried to figure it out. I don't know how gold mining works either, and I don't really care. What I care is, if I buy a gold coin, will it go up or down? So trying to figure out a lot of this, I just don't work that way. I'm thinking, how can I make it work for me? That's where Bitcoin is. Bitcoin has a guaranteed, built-in, definable endpoint. And you'll hear people talking about that. It's 20, I'm not even, the, 21, 24. There's a certain number of Bitcoin that are ever going to be created in total. That would be as if you knew the day there was going to be no more gold mined out of the earth. So when people say, well, Bitcoin's going to 50,000 or 100 or 500,000 or a million, I don't, they're right. It could go to half a million dollars. A brick of gold's half a million dollars. So when somebody goes, Bitcoin will never get there, why not? If you think about it, it is a democratized, decentralized investment asset, in my opinion. The guys in Mexico, Bangladesh, you know, Haiti, these people have never had access to direct financial investments. That's where I kind of see Bitcoin. And to me, it's the great equalizer. And what I mean by that, gosh, this is like I didn't even get the greens right. <laughs> Horrible. Anyway, if somebody wanted to go buy a stock, if you had $1,000 and wanted to buy an Amazon stock, Number one, Amazon stock is $1,500. So first off, you're out of, out of luck. You can't buy a fraction of an Amazon stock. And if any of you walked into a broker and said, I want to buy one stock, do you think they're going to talk to you? That's what I mean. 98% of the world's population has never had access to financial instruments. They've never had access. Millennials are growing up with phones in their hand and, and debit cards, they've never touched money. Bitcoin is just this fascinating digital asset, but in my opinion, it's the great democratizer. Most 30% investments were reserved, 30% returns were reserved for the groups that had $200 million to invest in a pre-ICO to get in early. If you want a 30% return and you've got $200 and you get an ooh la or a ninja or a, I can, a, Envion, I keep wanting to throw an S in there. Guys, the returns are the same, but it's been greatly democratized. So Bitcoin to me is the great equalizer. Let's move forward. Now we've got Bitcoin, but now we've got this thing called Ethereum and EOS. Have you guys heard of Ethereum and EOS? Here's the way I personally describe Ethereum. Bitcoin, simple unit, can't do much with it. It's like a coin. Well, I looked at Ethereum and I said, what the heck is this? And here's the way I looked at it. Ethereum to me is like an iPhone. You guys ever had an iPhone? Everybody has one. If that phone was just a phone, a phone is just a phone. What did iPhone do uniquely different? 
they opened it up to allow people to build apps on top of it. So they created an ecosystem where people could build on top of the iPhone. That's technically simply what Ethereum is. So when somebody creates an ICO, it's really like creating an app on top of an iPhone where Ethereum just said, hey, we've got this platform. If you want to take a portion of it, go build your company. We'll support it. But just like iPhones, the more apps you have on an iPhone, the iPhone sort of slows down. You can have too much storage, not enough storage, too much. Ethereum's the same way. The more apps that are on the Ethereum network, the more it potentially slows down. It has some limitations. But that, to me, was all I needed to know about Ethereum and said, all right, if I want to build an app, how do I build an app on Ethereum? Now, EOS is coming along. EOS is a better system. If you ever watch David Moss speak, he talks about an operating system. That's fine. I sort of get it. But I sat down with David and said, what is it really? Here's, in my opinion, all EOS is. It's pretty simple. They have an operating system like an iPhone. It's just better and faster. You can now build apps on top of it. But what they did uniquely different, if you have an iPhone and you have an iTunes account and a Grubhub account and a Flixster account, you have to enter in credit and payment and you've got different mechanisms. EOS is creating a universal token that you can spend across all their networks. That's EOS. So if you want to be part of that infrastructure, that's great. If you want to be an application in the network, it would be like building an app on an iPhone and being part of that ecosystem. And I clear that with David Moss, just so you know. He was in the room the first time I did it. I said, David, make sure I'm not putting your company down. But at a high level, that's really all EOS is. It's a very simple platform. Moving on. Everybody's heard of cryptocurrency? I get that a lot. Are you in cryptocurrency? Cryptocurrency frustrates the heck out of me. I'm letting a friend of mine named John Najarian into our ICO. But the only way I let John in, I said, you have to fix this when you're talking on television. My opinion, cryptocurrency are the few coins, the few companies trying to actually be a payment system. Bitcoin, Dash, Zcash, there's only a few that are actually trying to be a payment mechanism. Most of them are really just tradable coins. Most of these ICOs are coins. They're like buying a stock. They're buying something. Ripple, Ripple the darling XRP. You're not supposed to ever use an XRP token to pay for your pizza. They're not trying to be a currency. They're a currency platform, but they're not a cryptocurrency. So if you can, let's all kind of you know, get our head around changing the mentality of people. Cryptocurrency are things trying to be currency. Crypto coins are just a little bit different. Does that make sense at all? All right, because it's awfully quiet in here, so I may be bombing, but I'm going to keep going. You guys are stuck. All right. Crypto versus blockchain. I was like, all right, what's next? Well, crypto to me is some are attempts at currency, some are attempts at coin, but some of the companies are disruptive, right? When you look at things like energy, when you look at certain things, certain blockchain companies are going to disrupt industries. Many of them are actually just going to pre create efficiencies within the ecosystem of companies as a whole. So you can look at your company and say, all right, if the blockchain's like the internet, to me, cryptocurrency is like e-commerce. A lot of the ICOs are like stocks, and I can start putting them in sectors. These guys are energy companies. These guys are fintech companies. Tony and Ninja is a communication platform. They're just segments on top of a blockchain, just like they're segments on top of the internet. Blockchain powers it. Don't worry about how it works. Figure out how it works for you and your business and then you can be successful. Smart contracts, everybody goes, like, these guys confuse me. Smart con anybody heard of a smart contract? Does anybody know what it really is? Few people? I, 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 again, I'm like, how does this crap work? So I sat down with somebody that explained contracts to me. I said, all right, here's how I'm going to explain it. If I sold any of you a business, and let's say I'm selling the business for $5 million, and this is the way we traditionally do paperwork. We create a contract. We agree on the final terms. We have the final paperwork. We PDF it. We send it to the, to the buyer. The buyer signs it, sends it back to us. We sign it. Now we've got counterparty signatures on a $5 million sale. Would you guys agree? I mean, yeah. it, it, there's a million, but it's pretty simple. The way blockchain works is a little bit different because if I sent that contract to Bob, he's going to sign it and send it back to me, and now I'm going to take my Adobe Acrobat, break the PDF, change that sale price from $5 million to $6.5 I'm going to sign it, re-PDF it, 
attach my signature, he owes me six and a half million dollars, and he has to prove he doesn't. That's the problem. Smart contracts just simply say, when these are going back and forth, that little piece of paper is broken up in a thousand different computers, and at the end it's put back together with a timestamp, so no one person can change it. And if it does get changed, it just creates a new timestamp. So to me, some of this stuff is simple. Food security, the same thing. Any of you that buy food, what we want to do is we want to know, hey, is it organic? Where did it come from? Blockchain's just going to give you a record of where the food came from all through the food chain. For consumers, that's important. For businesses, it's vital. Unilever's using food security because if a kid dies eating food delivered by Unilever, they are responsible. But if there's seven people in the supply chain, who has li liability? Well, if the guy that was supposed to, to refrigerate something for three days gave you paperwork saying he refrigerated it and he really didn't, that's where the spoilage happened. You have no throughput. You have no visibility. The blockchain is just going to allow you to see where that liability lies. So again, when everybody says, oh, it's going to disrupt attorneys. Yeah, but some of it's just going to make due diligence easier, discovery easier. So again, how does the blockchain work for you? Banking the same way. It's just going to create efficiencies in the banking side. Why investor contribute? I only have a couple slides left here. The, the ICOs to me are fascinating. They're online. They're fast. Technically to me, they're like glorified Kickstarter campaigns. It's like Kickstarter without a backpack. Right? I put $100 in. I hope I get a backpack. I'm buying it at a discount because I'm one of the early guys. Do you guys know 40% of all Kickstarter programs fail? Is it 70 now? Well, I think 70, um, there's 40 that never get to market and 70 that fail. There's, there's about 40 that never even get to product. But, but it could be, regardless, 40 to 70% fail. 90% of all businesses fail. So when people go, oh, ICOs are risky, so is a business. So is a Kickstarter campaign. Like this stuff all kind of works the same. But an ICO, if it works, you get liquidity, you get money back, you get a community that allows you to monetize things much faster. So the tradable asset of the ICO is to me is exciting. But what happened was, I deal a lot with hedge funds, family offices, do we have EVCs in here? Family offices, big investors, wow, normally we do, they must be at the Oscar parties, okay. I had to learn how to explain ICOs to my investment community and this is the way I explained it. If we try and raise money in the, quote, traditional sense, we do an angel round. It's like our friends and family round, and we're at a 10-cent stock, and then we go along about a year, and if we're successful, we'll try and raise $4 million in a Series A, and then about a year or two later, if we're really doing well, we get $10 million in a Series B, and then a little bit later, 3 to 5, we get $20 million in a Series A. So by the time we're done begging for money, we're at about $35 million in three to five years in a very expensive, time-consuming process. Raising money in a traditional sense is time-consuming. It's expensive. It takes the CEO off mission. But most importantly, the biggest failure for startups is lack of funding. If they fail at any one of these inflection points, everybody loses. So the capital guys have all the control, total strings. Along come ICOs. The way I explained the ICOs to my hedge fund guys, I said it's just accelerated capital. But the difference is you now have a fear of missing out because, hey, guys, this is our actual round. This is the way ours works on Monetto Pro. We're at a 10-cent round. This one's closed. If you don't get in this round, our next round's 25. If you don't get in the Series A, as soon as that closes, our next round's at 50. And when that closes, I've already priced our rounds out. This is FOMO. This is fear of missing out. This is the way you accelerate your investments. But to me, an ICO all of a sudden is not three to five years, it's three to five months. And in some cases, 35 minutes. Does anybody want to guess how an ICO raises $35 million in 35 minutes? With things like Telegram that have 30,000 people in it waiting. But that didn't exist. So the internet didn't exist before the internet existed. What I mean by that is without Telegram and these technologies, you can't build a community to try and get a community to buy your product because they want to participate. The gates from the financial institution are broken. But these guys have a lot of money. So the last couple slides was I needed to come up with a way to get 
the big companies investing. So any of you that are trying to do an ICO or thinking or hoping, pay attention to this one. This is a, a, not a legal slide, but it's very interesting. ICOs, in my opinion, are disconnected from reality. They are like investing in an ice cube on a hot summer day on a sidewalk. In traditional finance lens, they don't make sense. Doesn't mean they're bad or wrong. Here's what I mean. There's no governance. There's no equity. There's no oversight. There's no financial committee. There's no board seat. There's no distribution unless you do a very specific security offering, which is different. They're not tied to revenue. They're not tied to P. They're not tied to anything except supply and demand, hype, exposure, which is fine. Eventually, they're going to have to be tied to execution. So how do you get big companies into ice cubes on a sidewalk. I created a structure called a toquity. If you that are in finance, you'll follow this quickly. Anybody else, don't get bored. I'm done after this. A toquity simply says, if you're a big venture fund, you cannot invest in ICOs because your charter does not allow you to. So they have to set up side funds and then their limited partners get pissed. It's a mess. We create a structure that says, hey, if you're willing to write that first one to $5 million check, you get equity in the parent company but your equity is a fourth of what you're used to. So instead of putting a million to five million in and getting 20, 25, 30%, you're probably gonna get five. So you're giving up a lot, but by investing in equity, you actually fit your legal guidance and you're investing. Then the token sits off on the side like a writer. It's technically a warrant, but we can't call it a warrant because we're not an investable security. But for the legal structure, the token off on the side sits there and it's only executed on if the company is doing well and there's liquidity. So if a company comes in and writes a check for one to five million for equity at 10 cents, they've got a call on the token at another five million dollars at 10 cents. So now you accelerate, you say, look, your equity is a six, nine, 12 year exit. Your token is a six, nine, 12 month exit. But the third component is the most critical. If the company is successful, right? If Ooh La La raises 35 or 50 million, or Tony does, or these guys raise 100, that is non-diluted equity. What that means is that company has raised money that's coming back into the corporation and not diluting the original shareholders. That's how you get, if you had a 5% of a company and never got diluted out again, and that company could raise 30, 50, 100 million dollars, it is a massive shift for financial structures. So we're trying to spend time bringing in the big finance guys to ICOs, not trying to convince them whether it's a utility or security. We don't care. I don't know where it's, the market's going to end up. We're saying, hey, invest for equity, get the token, and the question, you have to love the lawyers. Well, what if something happens? What if the business goes bad? What, we're going to get sued. Well, you're going to get sued if it's a bad investment anyway. But the worst you get sued for here is being a bad negotiator because you got 5%, not 20 the risk profile is the same. So this legal structure we think is going to work. Last, what do I think the future of crypto is? Bitcoin to me is interesting. I think it's an asset. Moneta Pro, the system we built, a closed loop payment. It could actually be a global currency. Crypto coins, I think, are like equity. I believe they're going to continue to grow for a lot of reasons. Blockchain, though, I totally believe is going to work. Blockchain to me, like I said, it's like the internet. But don't try and figure out how the internet works. Just figure out how the internet works for you. All right, so that's it. Thank you very much.